Okay, folks, our next video focuses on something that's called trees in graph theory. This is a very important section because we're going to be using trees later on when we apply algorithms to find paths on graphs and to find circuits and minimum circuits and that type of thing. Okay, so I want to start with what he's got here and we are going to look at what they ask us to investigate. So let's first look at that graph that's there on the screen. Just autofocus and lock the autofocus. There we go. <clears throat> so it says, here's a graph. Okay. Find a subgraph with the smallest number of edges that is still connected and contains all the vertices. So we want a graph that is a connected graph. In other words, for a graph to be connected, you must be able to go from one vertex to any other vertex using any any particular path. It's not supposed to be a complete graph, it's just supposed to be a connected graph. Okay, so let's see. A subgraph has all the vertices of the original graph here. Okay, that's what they said. But the smallest number of edges. So we can start anywhere. We can go there, here, there, 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 and there. There's one subgraph that does just that. Okay, it's the smallest number of edges. How do I know it's the smallest number of edges? Well, each vertex has a valence of 2 or a degree of 2, except for the first and the last vertex which has a degree of 1. So in other words, there's no repeated paths. How many edges are there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So there's 6 edges for case number 1. Now let's look at case number 2. He asks us to find a subgraph with the largest number of edges that does not contain any cycles. Now remember what a cycle is. A cycle is a circuit. An example of a circuit would be those three dots there. It's a closed figure. It forms a circuit. Okay? We don't want that in our graph. So if I still have the same number of vertices that I had before, which is here, but now I want a subgraph with the largest number of edges that does not contain a cycle or a circuit. Okay, so let's go one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, there's again six edges. There's no circuit there. When would there have been a circuit? Well, if I possibly have joined those again or came back here, then I formed a little circuit over here. Or wherever I repeated something, I would have formed a circuit. Okay, so that's important. He asks then, what do you notice? Well, what we notice is that for both graph, the graphs that we've drawn, there's six edges. Okay, now this is going to become a useful conclusion. It says, One very useful common approach to studying graph theory is to restrict your focus to only graphs of a particular kind. Okay, now in this case, that is that we are going to do now. We are going to look at trees. Particular kind of graph, we're looking at trees. Let's define a tree. Well, a tree is a connected graph containing no cycles. So a tree is a connected graph, meaning all the vertices can reach one another in some other way, by either passing through other vertices or not. And there's no cycles, so there's no circuits, there's no closed figures created. Okay? A forest, then, is a graph containing no circuits or cycles. Note that this means a connected forest is a tree. Okay, so if you have a forest that's connected, you have a tree. 
He says one thing to keep in mind here is that while the trees we study in graph theory are related to trees, you might see in other subjects the correspondence is not exact. Now there he's referring to things like family trees, like a tree diagram that we get in statistics. Um, yeah, those are not correspondent in correspondence with what we are going to look at. Now I want to look at this in example form. So here, a tree is a connected graph with no cycle. So this is a tree. In a tree, there's only one way to get from one node to the other, and that's that way. To get from here to here, there's only one way. To get from there to there, there's only one way. Okay? To get from here to there, you've got to go that way. Okay. But it isn't true with general graphs. So if this is a tree, here we have a forest. A forest is a bunch of trees. So this is a forest with two things in it, basically, two trees in it. And this is a forest that's created by one tree. Okay, now remember a forest is a graph that contains no cycles. Fine. So here's an example of something that's neither a tree nor a forest. If you look at it, 2, 5, 7, 4, that is a cycle. 3, 4, 7, 9, 8, that forms a cycle. So it can't be a tree, because it can't be a tree, it can also not be a forest. Okay, so what is a tree? We're going to look at these just now. A tree is a connected graph in which no cycles are present. It can be simply called an undirected acyclic connected graph. Now, undirected means there's no direction that you need to follow from one vertex to the other. An important property of a tree is that every pair of nodes in a tree has exactly one and only one path between them. Okay, so let us go and look at, before we come back to what I've got here, let us look at what we need to know about trees. And we're going to look at it by looking at four postulates. Okay, let's continue by looking at the properties of trees. Okay, we saw already, before we go there, he says that what, what is important for us to think about when we look at the properties of trees is what make trees special and what is special about trees that will help us with our work in graph theory. The first thing he says is repeating again that a tree is a connected graph with no cycles. Okay? We would therefore like to know whether there are any graph theoretical properties that all trees have and perhaps even that only trees have. Are there properties that we need to be aware of that is unique to the notion of a tree? Now we're going to consider three propositions about trees. These will also illustrate important proof techniques that we've learned in the previous chapter, folks, that apply to graphs in general and happen to be a little easier for trees. Okay, so our first proposition. A graph T is a tree, if and only if, between every pair of distinct vertices of this tree, there's a unique path. Now, key word here is unique. Unique means there's one and only one path. Okay, so a graph tree, a graph T is a tree, if and only if, between any every pair <laughs> Of, dis of vertices or distinct vertices of T, there is a unique path. Okay, let's see how we are going to go about proof. So, looking at this proof is rather interesting, folks. I'm going to read through the proof with you and try and make sense of it for you. This is an if and only if statement that we were looking at. So we must prove two implications. That's important. That must be proven if there's an if and only if statement. We start by proving that if T is a tree 
Then, between every pair of distinct vertices, there's a unique path. Okay, so we start by assuming it's a tree. And we let u and v be distinct vertices of such a tree. If t has only one vertex, then the conclusion is satisfied immediately, because there can't be repeat paths. Okay, so we must show two things to show that there's a unique path between the vertices u and v. That, first of all, there is a path between them, which there is because we assumed it's a tree. And that there's not one more than one path between them, so that that path is unique. The first of these is automatic, okay? There is a connection between the two. So there is a path between the vertices. To show that the path is unique, we suppose there are, uh, sorry, yeah, we suppose there are two paths between u and v, so that we get a contradiction. The two paths might start out the same, but since they are different, there is some first vertex u prime, after which the two paths diverge. Okay, so however. Since the two paths both will end then in the vertex V, there is some first vertex after U prime that they have in common, and we'll call that V prime. Now consider the two paths from U prime to V prime. Taken together, they form a cycle or a circuit which contradicts the assumption that it's a tree, because a tree is a connected graph with no cycles. Okay, so that takes care of that. Now we consider the converse. If between every pair of distinct vertices of T there is a unique path, okay, then T is a tree. So we're saying if there is a unique path, then there is a tree. So we assume the hypothesis that between every pair of vertices, vertices of T, there is a unique path. Okay? To prove that T is indeed a tree, we must show it is connected, first of all, and that it has no cycles. Okay? The first half is easy. T is connected because there is a path between every pair of vertices. That's our assumption. Okay? So to show that T has no cycles, we assume that it does have cycles and then prove the contradiction in that statement. Okay, so what? Let U and V be two distinct vertices in a cycle of T. Since we can get from u to v by going clockwise, u to v by going clockwise, they, okay, uh, let me, since we can get from u to v by going clockwise or counterclockwise around the cycle, there are two paths from u to v, which contradicts our assumption that the path is unique. Therefore, yeah we have proved the contradiction. So we've established that both directions. So we have completed our proof. Okay, I suggest you read through that proof very slowly to make sure that you see and make sense of it. Okay, let's read on. We go to our corollary at the bottom. Now he says here that notice that both directions had two paths paths in our proof at the top. The existence of paths, first of all, and the uniqueness of paths. Okay. Our next um, corollary that deals with the properties of uh, trees is corollary 422 on your page 249. It says a graph F is a forest if and only if between any pair of its vertices in this F, there is at most one path. Then it's a forest. Okay, so a graph F is a forest, again an if and only if statement. Between any pair of its vertices, pairs of its vertices in F, there is at most one path. 
Now let's see how we will prove that. Okay, so it seems that I spoke too quickly. That proof is actually one of the um, problems that you're supposed to do for homework in your problem section. Okay, so let's look at our second proposition, which tells us that all trees have leaves. Now remember, what is a leaf? It's a vertex of degree 1. So an example of that would be here, that's a leaf. Vertex of degree 1. Okay, the proposition says the following. Any tree with at least two vertices has at least two vertices of degree 1. So in other words, it has two leaves. Any uh, tree T with two vertices have two leaves. That's what we're going to prove, just so you can see what I'm doing there. Okay, now let's have a look. He says we prove this by contradiction. We let T be a tree that is at least has two vertices and suppose, contrary to stipulation, that there are not two vertices of degree 1. Okay, so we're looking at the situation there and we're saying there's not um, two vertices of degree 1. So let P be the path in T of longest possible length and let U and V be the endpoints of that path. Since T does not have two vertices of degree 1, at least one of them must have a degree of 2 or higher. Let's say this is U, that the degree here is 2 or higher than 2. We know that U is adjacent to a vertex in the path P. Okay, but now it must also be adjacent to another vertex which we will call U prime. Prime rather, because we're assuming that there's a degree of 2 here. Where is this U prime? Well, it cannot be a vertex of the path of P, okay, the path P, because if it was, there would be two distinct paths, um, u to u2, uh, to u prime. The edge between them in the first part of p, well, that's up to u prime. But u prime also cannot be outside of that path p. For if it was, there would be a path from u prime to v. Now, if there was a path from u prime to v, then it, uh, sorry, if there was a path from u prime to v that was longer than the original path p, which has longest possible length. This is a contradiction and proves that there must be at least two vertices of degree 1. In fact, we can say a little more. u and v must both have degree 1. Okay, so remember what did we do here? We proved it by contradiction, by proving that if there is more than one path uh, in uh, the more than one path P, that there is indeed a longest path. But then we cannot have this because there's a cycle forming there. Okay, so it will have at most degree one. Okay, now folks. The rest I'm going to leave up to you to prove. Your proofs are in your book. You can read through them by yourself. So let's just look at this proposition number three. It says, let T be a tree with V vertices and E edges. Okay? So T is a tree that has V vertices and E edges. Then what if E is the edges? and V is the vertices, we've already seen that the number of edges is vertices minus 1 in a tree. Remember, we're talking a tree here. Okay. So, 
Again, let the tree, let T be a tree with V vertices and E edges. Then the number of edges will be one less than the number of vertices. Now that is almost makes sense. If we draw any tree here, let's say the tree runs there. There's four vertices and three edges. Okay, you can get from one vertex to another vertex by passing through other vertices. There's also no circuits there, so that's definitely a tree. Okay, so guys, read through this. They prove it in the book by using mathematical induction. So make sure you understand that proof and that you see exactly how you can use induction to prove that statement. Let's just quickly talk about what he's written after the proof here. It says there's a very important feature about induction proof that is worth noting. Induction makes sense for proofs about graphs because we can think of graphs as growing into larger graphs. However, this does not work. It would not be correct to start with a tree that has k vertices and then add a new vertex and an edge to get to a tree with k plus 1 vertices and note that the number of edges also grew by 1. Why is this bad? Because how do you know that every tree with k plus 1 vertices is the result of adding a vertex to your arbitrary tree, a starting tree? You don't know that. Now the point is, whenever you give an induction proof that a statement about graphs that holds for all graphs with v vertices, you also start with an arbitrary graph with v plus 1 vertices and then you reduce that graph to a graph with v vertices. So instead of working to k plus 1, you go back to k minus 1, to which you can apply your inductive hypothesis. Okay, folks, let's talk about rooted trees. This is another important or interesting concept that he talks about. He says with rooted trees, basically, the data is often structured like a tree. Now, we saw that when you did statistics and statistical reasoning. Okay? The graph will not have any cycles. In other words, it will be a tree. Okay? Before it can be a rooted tree. There must not be any cycles. So, as soon as one vertex of a tree is designated as a root, so anyone, you choose anyone, then every other vertex on the tree can be characterized by its position relative to the root. Now, if that's the root, then this will be the thing that follows from the root, the next ones. Then we can have one following from there and there. So this will be the parent, this will be the children, and this will be the grandchildren of the parent. The root of the graph is the parent. This is the child of the parent. And you can see the children are not next to each other. In other words, they are they not adjacent. There's nothing connecting them other than the parent. Now this child had two children of its own. So this is grandchildren. We can think of these as grandchildren of the parent vertex. In other words, the root. Okay, he talks about it here. He says, if two vertices are adjacent, then we say one of them is the parent of the other, which is the child of the parent, the other one. So if they are adjacent, the one is the parent vertex, the other one is the child of the parent. So here's two adjacent. So this is the parent of these two vertices. And those are children of that parent. Okay. So of the two, the parent is the vertex that is the closest to the root. So of these two, if it continues, the parent is the one that's closest to the root vertex. Okay, then he continues and he talks about, let's just go where I stopped last, that's the root of a tree is a parent. 
but is not the child of any vertex. So it's unique in this respect. All non-root vertices have exactly one parent. All non-root vertices has exactly one parent. Okay, so if this is the root vertex, these are all non-root vertices. These non-root vertices has that, uh, that vertex as a parent. Okay, so let's see what is important about that. Now, he talks about what I've spoken now. He talks about having a grandchild um, in terms of these vertices. So, not surprising, he says the child of a child is called a grandchild. And its relation to the root vertex is its, the root vertex is its grandparent. So, more in general, we say that a vertex V is a descendant of a vertex U, provided U is the vertex on the path from V to the root vertex. Okay, so if this is the root vertex, the parent vertex to this child vertex, and this child had another child here. I'm just going to call it C1 and C2. So what he's saying is that C1 is a relative of the root vertex P. If, if now look at that, provided that U is a vertex on the path back to the root vertex or the parent vertex, vertex. Okay? So we call this an ancestor of that. This is an ancestor of that. And as this graph grows and grows and grows, these are all ancestors of the root vertex at the top. So for most, most trees, he says, there will be pairs of vertices, neither of which is a descendant of the other. So, <laughs> he calls them cousins or siblings. In fact, vertices U and V are called siblings, provided that they have the same parents. So, in our case, C1 and C2 are both siblings because they have the same parent C. Now, if there's another B, let's call it B, that was born from this parent, these two will be siblings because they share the top. In fact, vertices, okay, they are siblings. Note that siblings are never adjacent. So there's nothing, no path that connects the siblings. And we can see why that is indeed the case. Okay, so if we look at this graph that is on the screen there. Example 4.5.2. I'm just going to cover the discussion. We're going to have our own discussion about this graph. So if I say that this here is my root vertex, then that root had three children. There's the children of the root vertex. Okay? Notice that they're not adjacent. These children did not go on to create more branches, so that's where that stopped. But here, this child had, I'm going to put CC for the second child, okay? This had, this particular person or vertex had three children. They are all relatives of R because we pass through C to get back to them. Okay, so all of these are relatives of R. There's a third one, a fourth one here, which is also CC. And here is the very grand um, grandchild of R. Okay, it is its parents is the at vertex C, the CC. So you can see if you pick. Any other, if you pick this as a root vertex, things will look different on this graph. So it all depends on where you choose to start or where you identify your root vertex. Okay, folks, so all of this language that we've learned here, grandparents, parents, grandchildren, relatives, descendants, ancestors, all of that helps us describe how we navigate through a tree. 
We say we're traversing a tree. Now what does that mean? It means you visit each vertex in some order. Okay, so traversing a tree is a key step in many algorithms that we're going to look at. Even if the tree we are considering is not rooted, we can always form a rooted tree by picking any vertex as the root. So any vertex as the starting point of what it is that we want to do. Okay, now he gives us an example of that. He says, explain why every tree is a bipartite graph. Now let's just give that some thought. Bipartite graphs are made up of vertices where there are no um, or adjacent vertices where the one belongs to one set and the other one belongs to another set. Okay, and now that's number one. And number two, where there also are no connections, adjacency between vertices that belongs to one set and vertices that belongs to another set. So let's see what he says. To show that a graph is bipartite, we need to divide the vertices into two sets. Okay, and here he says, here's an algorithm that does that. You designate a vertex as a root. And that's pretty much what we did in our method. Put this vertex in set A. Now put all the children of this vertex in set B. Why do we do that? Because they are adjacent to the parent vertex. Okay? Now none of these vertices are of the siblings are adjacent vertices. Okay? So so far we good. Now we put into A every child of every vertex B. So in other words, every grandchild of the root vertex. We keep on doing this okay, until all the vertices have been assigned to one of the two sets, alternating between A and B for every generation. Okay, So if you have set 1 here and you have set 2 here, each generation will be in a different set. That is, a vertex is in set B if and only if it is a child from a vertex that is in the first set. Okay, so all the vertices here are children of these, all the other way around, depending on how we started. Okay, and that is the algorithm that he describes in showing that what happens in bipartite graphs. Okay, folks, there's a nice comment that's made after this. Once we've gone through this algorithm, it says, we can choose to visit all the vertices in the same generation before we visit any vertices in the next generation. Okay? This approach is usually called the breadth-first search. We say search because you often traverse a tree looking for vertices that have certain properties. Now in contrast to that, he says, what you can do is you look for one, for one child of the root to put in B. Okay, so you start with the root, putting the root in A. Then you look for their children, you put them in B. Then you look for their children, you put them back in A, and you go back and forth. When you get to a vertex that has no children, retreat to its parent to see if the parent has any other children. Okay, so you go back and you see are there any other children there. So we travel as far from the root as possible. When backtracking until, or then we backtrack, sorry, until we can move forward again. This is called a depth first search. Okay, so these algorithm, algorithmic explanations can serve as a proof that every tree is bipartite. Very important. Every tree is bipartite. Although, care needs to be spent to prove that the algorithms are correct. Okay, so in our next video, we're going to start looking at the exciting stuff. And this is called spanning trees. So please, if you learned something and you liked the video, please like it on the page and make sure to join my channel to subscribe to the channel.